morning. Thank you for that introduction. Good morning. Good to see everybody so bright and early. Uh, it's nice of you to come early, get the good seats. And I know they said no cell phones and uh, no cameras, but I'm going to take a picture of you and tweet it if you don't mind. If everybody can stand up here. Come on, stand up. I got to kind of back there too. You've been sitting there for a while waiting for this to start. I want to do a little promotion here for TEDx. All right, everybody wave. Awesome. Well, not an awesome picture, but I don't know if it's you or me, but maybe both. All right, send, saving, save, send, send. All right, now it's now tweeted. That's why I'm here. Thank you very much. <laughs> so in thinking about what to talk about today, I've really been struck by how remarkable the TED franchise has grown over the past uh, 10 years. And this notion of TEDx, when you know, Chris Anderson and the team started you know, thinking about this, they really had no idea it would grow as quickly and as virally and now be in, in, in having, holding events like this. It's really amazing how, how quickly it's grown. I really want to congratulate the team that put on TEDx at uh, Mid-Atlantic because it really is an extraordinary gathering of people. And thank you all for, for coming. In terms of what I want to talk about today, I've been reflecting this year, it's sort of a year of reflection because it was 25 years ago this year that I started AOL. And for me, that's, you know, there's been a lot of events, 25th anniversary, and it's given me a time to reflect. And as I've been thinking about it, it particularly as related to this talk, there really were three areas that I thought would be interesting to touch on in terms of what's happened over the last 25 years and what might happen over the next 25 years. And the first is the internet, what happened that first 25 years and where are we going in what I think will be the second internet revolution. The second is what's happened in this region, the mid-Atlantic region, DC, Virginia, Maryland, over the last 25 years, really going from what it would be hard not to call it 25 years ago, sort of an entrepreneurial backwater, to now a very vibrant innovation city. And the third is what's happened over the last 25 years in politics, which obviously our, our, this is our nation's capital. And I have generally good news. Two of the three, I'm pretty optimistic about where we are and where we're going. And you might be able to guess which is the one that's a little bit more, more troubling. So in my time, I'll try to touch briefly on those three. The first, obviously, is close to my heart, which is what's happened with the internet. When we got started 25 years ago, as some of you may remember, it really was the vision that someday everybody would be connected. And at the time, almost nobody was. I think it was one or two million people in the country had you know, personal computers. Even at the time, you know, the PCs were pretty expensive. If you wanted to communicate, get online, you had to actually go to the peripheral section of the computer store to get this thing called a modem. The idea of communicating was viewed by the computer industry as sort of peripheral to the core computing experience, which was about spreadsheets and word processors and so forth. So it took a long time, really a decade, before we were, start, were able to build the, the, the basic framework in terms of PCs being more consumer friendly and modems being built into PCs and the cost of networks coming down and the ease of use in terms of service going up and having a wide variety of, of things that people would find value in. And as you all know, over the last 25 years, that's gone from a little idea that I and some other people, including Alvin Toffler, who, who really was one of the people who was influential in my life when I read his book, The Third Way, which talked about the notion of an electronic frontier. It's evolved from that you know, kind of quirky idea that at the time most people thought would be really limited to more computer hobbyists, never have mainstream acceptance, to now where it really is a part of everyday life and people are connected to the internet. And as many of you know, you're connected almost all the time through multiple devices and multiple networks. So I think the first internet revolution, really building that platform, the core technology and networks and building the audience and convincing people that it was something they should pay attention to, I can think we could say we've done a good job on, on that front. Now we're shifting to what I think of as the second internet revolution. And how do you take that platform, take the internet, and really use it to fundamentally restructure parts of our everyday life that are really important, you know, healthcare and transportation uh, and philanthropy and politics. There's all kinds of op education. There's all kinds of ways we can take these tools and really disrupt what currently exists and innovate in lots of different ways. And a lot of that's begun to happen. And certainly there's some industries, you know, music and books and others that already have been disrupted by this first wave of the internet. But I think it's very exciting to think of what the second wave will bring, taking things like healthcare, which is a, one of our nation's biggest challenges, a 
and, and you know, biggest expenses, and really using technology, engaging consumers to think about and manage their health more effectively, whether it be how do you stay healthy or how do you deal with chronic disease, which is a very significant problem, or how are you much more strategic, much smarter about dealing with life-threatening uh, diseases? How do you use the internet because you now have the benefit of ubiquity to, d to fundamentally change how we think about transportation, cars, for example. There's a lot of innovative things happening, some on the car sharing side, like Zipcar that we've been involved in, uh, some in terms of even developing cars that can drive themselves because of GPS technology. It's really quite interesting to see how that will develop over the next 25 years, or education, and things like TED are helpful on this front, but how do you kind of remove the need to be physically in a place and not just show videos on the internet, which is a good start, but create discussion groups around that and interaction around that, so it really is a much more visceral, lifelong learning. So there's all kinds of things that are going to happen in the second internet revolution. It's very, very exciting, and I hope some of you are working on some of those bigger ideas. Indeed, one of my frustrations is too many people now are focused on little ideas, almost built-to-flip companies, little products, little services, and I, I think we need more focus on the built-to-last, iconic, change-the-world kinds of companies, and whether you're focused on you know, education or, or healthcare or transportation or energy or, or many of the other areas that could use disruption, I hope You'll, you'll be leaders in trying to drive this second internet revolution. So that's the first topic. The second topic uh, relates to what's happened in this region. As I said, when we got started, it was kind of hard. I mean, it, was, it was not an entrepreneurial town. This was a town that really was dominated by government, dominated by government contractors, and there really was no ecosystem around innovation and entrepreneurship. And it's amazing to see what's happened in the last 25 years. And in, f in fairness, we're not at the level of Silicon Valley or Route 128 around uh, you know, Boston or, or what have you, but it's amazing to see how much progress uh, we've made. When we got started, we actually had to go to other cities, New York and California, to get venture capital. Now we have tons of venture capital here, whether it be early stage angel funding or, or later stage uh, kind of Series A, Series B you know, funding. We had to go to Boston to get lawyers who really understood what entrepreneurial companies were about and how to establish strategic partnerships and think about you know, capitalization and so forth. Now there's tons of infrastructure there. And we now also have the benefits through AOL's success and MCI and, and, and some other companies of the, this talent begetting talent and new ideas really flourishing because there is the beginnings of an ecosystem here. So again, there's still work to be done in terms of you know, capital and celebrating entrepreneurship and, and mentoring and, and really trying to encourage the next wave of companies. But I think we should feel good about the progress we've made over the last 25 years and really establishing this region as a magnet for innovation and a magnet for people who really do want to change the world and believe this is a place where they can do that. They don't have to be somewhere else to be able to, to really make a, make a difference. So that's all great. The third area is the one that is, is, is more troubling. Uh, 25 years ago, and I should, I should preface this by, by saying what's probably obvious, which is our country and our democracy, which has been around for, as you well know, over 200 years, has always had partisanship. It always should have partisanship. There should be a competition among ideas and really a, a, you know, having the best ideas bubble to the surface. And that creative tension, that debate is a healthy thing. But it's unquestionable that in the last 25 years, there's been a coarsening of the political process that is quite troubling and does not position our nation effectively for the challenges that lie ahead. And everybody's frustrated by this. So, you know, I've spent a lot of time here and, and I've seen a lot of people who are great in politics really believed in serving their nation in, in that particular way. who have opted out of politics because it's just gotten, there's just too much brain damage associated with it. And most people agree with what the problems are. You know, some of it relates to actually media, including the internet. You know, everybody now having uh, a megaphone, sometimes there's a, it gets noisy and there's a cacophony of, of voices and even a dynamic where people are sometimes inventing their own facts. It's one thing to have a, a view, it's another thing to have your own set of, uh, of, of, of facts. And that, frankly, has been exacerbated by technology, the creation of uh, cable channels and internet blogs and what have you, are actually part of the problem. It's great that all those voices can be heard, but that does make the system a little noisier. But frankly, there's nothing we can do about that. that, that the genie's out of that bottle and the benefits of that freedom of expression trump the, the risks of, of that noisy system, but that has been part of the problem. 
Another part of the problem relates to essentially how campaigns are financed and the whole process of, of raising money, and there have been a lot of attempts to, to, to deal with that and kind of rein that in, and I hope something will happen on that front, but it's very challenging, particularly given some of the, the legal issues, including around freedom of expression. But there are two areas that also people focus on that I think over the next 25 years, hopefully we can get some traction on and get things headed in the right direction. One relates to the process that's called redistricting, sometimes called gerrymandering. And what's happened in the last couple of decades is really terrible. That in, in most states, the process of redrawing districts, which happens every uh, 10 years based on the census, which is an important process in terms of allocating seats in, in Congress, and so some level of redistricting needs to happen, but the process of how those districts are now drawn is really terrible and we need to figure out ways to have a fairer redistricting process. And there's some states like Iowa who've, who've taken steps in this direction and other states looking at it. And it's a very important issue to watch. In fact, there's a, a movie that's out now called Gerrymandering that's worth watching, trying to, you know, a documentary talking about this phenomenon. The reason it's so important is these districts are redrawn essentially to preserve the incumbent seat and to influence the way the elections happen in the future so it plays to the extremes whether it be on the left or be on the right, you're encouraged to talk to the extremes and you're discouraged to coming to the center and trying to have kind of common sense middle ground you know, solutions. So this redistricting process is part of this broader process of a broken uh, political uh, system. And the other is very basic, but I think very important. And it really is under the banner of civility. That although there's always going to be partisanship, there's always going to be vigorous debate, it's gotten terrible in terms of how people interact. Indeed, in most cases, people don't even interact. You're assuming members of your Congress are at least talking to each other. For the most part, they aren't. They're really in their own you know, caucuses, kind of hanging out with their own people who are, they're in violent agreement with, and not really talking across lines, not getting together even for you know, lunches and other ways to better understand each other and better understand each, each other's perspectives. And there's a whole series of efforts that are underway in the civility area. And I'm not naive about the, the challenges of this, but I do think it's very important that we take a fresh look at how we try to bring people together, whether it be on the redistricting front or on the civility front. Indeed, next week we'll be announcing something I agreed to uh, co-chair called the Democracy Project, part of something called the Bipartisan Policy Center, trying to deal with, with these issues. So in this particular case, reflecting on the past 25 years, it's really gotten much worse. Even 25 years ago, there was vigorous debate and, and uh, Reagan was the president at the time and the opposing party did not like a lot of things that he was, uh, he was pushing, but they still, Tip O'Neill and, and Ronald Reagan and others would get together and you know, understand each other's perspective, you know, have a beer or what have you, and talk about ways that they can come, to get, come together on some of these difficult issues for the country's benefit. That's now largely lost, and we need to get it back. So that's my reflection on the past uh, 25 years. It's been a, a wonderful 25 years, and I'm grateful I've had the opportunity to kind of see the world and see these different perspectives. As I said, in the first area, that first internet revolution, I think we made a lot of progress. And now we're ushering in the second uh, internet revolution. And I hope you all play a role in really trying to embed the internet and these capabilities into every aspect of our life and give consumers more choice and control and convenience in the areas that really are important to them. On the second area, I think we've made great strides in terms of the DC region as an incubator of great ideas, as a magnet for talent, as a real force for innovation, and with continued focus on capital and celebrating, encouraging entrepreneurship and mentoring entrepreneurs and some other breakout successes just down three blocks from here, one of the companies were involved, the Living Social, we had three people three years ago, it's 300 people today in the social commerce uh, space. 25 years ago, my guess is in order to get venture capital, they would have had to agree to move to California. Now the infrastructure's in place in terms of the capital and the talent uh, to scale these kind of companies, and hopefully we'll be scaling dozens of those over the next 25 years in this region. And finally, this more thorny problem, what can we all do to try to change the trajectory of politics in, in, in this town? And as I said, it's very complicated. The probability of success is low, but it's important, I think, for all of us to do what we can, and particularly important for us to use the internet and social media in particular as a way to galvanize the people's interest and really get people focused on, on these issues so we can get things on the right track. So thanks for coming to TEDx. It's been great to be here this morning. And please focus on these three issues and figure out what each of you can do, because if each of us does a little, together we can do a lot and we can change the world yet again. Thank you. Thank you.